Well, I'll get going then. So hi, welcome to this panel on cloud native security landscape, myths, dragons, and real talk. And the reason I put this panel together was I think basically, as you had seen from this morning, the keynotes and so on, this is a very active developing space. And I think even for those of us who are working in it, a very confusing developing space is to know, well, what is exciting for the next five years? What is practical now? And so on. Um, and so we'll get into why these people, lovely people are here. Um, <clears throat> just a few moments of talk. So I, hi, I'm Ed. I work at Sysdig on open source and Falco in particular. So I asked GPT, like everybody, you know, what, what do you think of the acronyms that Gartner uses about security? Just because I wanted to say, like you, I'm swimming in these things and I hate them, and surely it should be more simple to understand. So if Gartner has got some of these going on, great. Well, maybe, maybe they like acronyms too much. Let's, let's ask Forrester. Now, Forrester have their own set that they really like in chat GPT, thinks of theirs. So we have chance to reinvent the world in open source. We're standing on the shoulders of giants. Surely we can see more clearly than everyone who's gone before us in the industry and not follow the same confusing example. Well, I'm sorry, but we're inventing our own set of acronyms to go with them. Uh, ChatGPT <laughs> probably trained too late in the day to understand most of the ones we're uh, swimming in. But things like guac, salsa, s bombs, all these things that are coming out, all really important, or their place in the world, but where do we sit? Well, one place we don't start is with a simple architecture. Um, this was from the slide this morning in the keynote, just demonstrating some of the complexity of the attack surface in cloud native apps and, and installations. So that's why I gathered four friends who know everything there is to know about their part of the world to try and simplify some of this for us, try and give us some guides as to what is the best place to pay attention in cloud native security right now. In addition to the technology, the other thing we want to make sure we cover in this panel is kind of all these human elements. We hear a lot about the software supply chain. We know that we have to pay attention not to just what is actually running, but the whole lifecycle deploy, distribute, develop. This is from the Tag Security uh, Report on Cloud Native Security, by the way. So as we get going, I want to make sure you do some work as well in the crowd, because I think we'd love to get a sample of where you're at. So I've got some easy things from easy to hard. Raise your hand if you're using GitHub in production seriously. OK. Still not everybody. This is good. Kubernetes? OK, what about on clouds versus on-prem? In the cloud? OK, your hands down. On-prem? Thank you. And who is using any open source security tools right now? Well, I know you are, Laris. Um, do, could you catch out any of those out, please? Falco. Falco, thank you, crowd. <laughs> any others? Emily, you're cheating. I was like, <laughs> Kubernetes, awesome, thank you. Well, hopefully this gives everyone here a little uh, sample of where we're at. So I'd love to introduce my panelists. I'm going to get down from this sort of godlike overview and come around the side now so we can have a chat. Oh, we're not in order. Uh, you, well, well, we can introduce in any, in any order in particular. Um, but I've asked the panelists to maybe spend about 90 seconds introducing themselves, where they come from, kind of what they're working on. Um, Kim, should we go from you onwards? Thank you. Sure. Hey, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for joining today. Uh, my name is Kim Lewandowski. I'm currently uh, the head of product and a co-founder of a new startup called ChainGuard. We're about a year old now, uh, trying to help with all this software supply chain security stuff. Uh, prior to ChainGuard, I was uh, at Google for almost a decade, uh, working on some developer tools stuff and cloud products and then security. Uh, and then before I was a product manager, I was a developer. So I went to the dark side. And so, yeah, that's me. So Kim, what are you working on right now that people need to know about? Oh, wow. So um, yeah, I mean, at ChainGuard, we have some enterprise products around security space. So two of them right now. One is a risk management platform called ChainGuard Enforce uh, to help organizations get a handle on their supply chain security posture and give them some tools and 
uh, help them get better. And then we have another product called ChainGuard Images, which are um, hardened container-based images with all the software supply chain goodness uh, baked in. They're reproducible. Uh, we carry the pagers. We patch them for vulnerabilities. They come with S-bombs produced at build time. And uh, yeah, pretty cool. And so those are the main focus right now. And we're, we've been growing our team, so a lot of management and getting everyone <laughs> rallied. <laughs> so life's easy, right? Completely. <laughs> Laura. Hi, everyone. My name is Loris De Giovanni. I'm a CTO and founder at uh, Sysdig. Uh, Sysdig is my second company. My first company was called Case Technologies and was the commercial entity behind an open source network analyzer called Wireshark. So I've uh, been involved with uh, open source pretty much my whole career. Now, one of the roles that I have at Sysdig is uh, leading the open source team. Uh, for the first part of my career, it was more like computer networks and network analysis. And then after starting CISD in 2014, focusing a lot in cloud native security and visibility. One of the things that we do at CISD is Falco, the open source uh, uh, runtime detection tool, uh, which is part of the CNCF. For us, Randall. Hey, so what's up, everyone? I'm Randall. Nice to meet all of you. Uh, so I've been working in security in a lot of weird positions just for my whole life. Um, I got started doing operating system security for OpenBSD a really long time ago. Uh, then I wrote and sold video game hacks <laughs> for years, which was pretty fun. Um, then I got into the, uh, the IAM space, working on authentication and authorization for developers. And I did that at a company called StormPath. And we later got acquired by Okta. And then we built the developer platform at Okta. And now I work at Sneak uh, doing DevRel, which is super fun. And basically, we are just trying to make it easier to find and fix vulnerabilities in the software that everyone is writing. So yeah, that's me. So Randall, just before you head on, what does Sneak do exactly? Uh, yeah, so if you are not familiar with Sneak, please raise your hand real fast. Yeah, OK, cool. So we're a developer security tool. So you can plug us in, and we do static analysis of the software you're writing to help find vulnerabilities. Uh, we also look at dependencies, container images. We have a cloud security product, et cetera. But just everything developer security related. Thanks. Isaac. Hi, everyone. Uh, and uh, thanks for coming. Um, I'm glad to be here. My name is Isaac. Um, I'm a product manager at Google. Um, Right now, um, at Google, I work in uh, supply chain security. Um, two parts of my work. Number one is I work closely with uh, the Google open source security team, um, you know, um, who are behind such um, things as SigStore and, and Salsa. Um, Guac is, an, is a new project I saw on a slide earlier um, that I've been working on as well. Um, and then the other side of my work is on Google's internal first party supply chain. And so I uh, do a lot of work there right now um, on Google's first party production of S bombs and conformance with the executive order. Um, some of you may be familiar with. Um, my history, um, last 15 or so years, been at, at Google, Microsoft, Twitter, Stripe um, as a product manager. Um, and then in, in prehistory, um, again, uh, like him, was a developer. So uh, also flipped to the dark side a little while back. Glad to be here. Thank you. Hey. Lovely. Well, thank you so much for being here, panel. And hopefully, you've got an idea of what everyone's expert on and what we can talk about. Um, an exercise for you during the course of the panel. I had meant to sit everybody left to right in terms of their place in the supply chain. If you can figure this out and tell us what order people should be sitting in by the time we're done, then there is a non-specific prize of little value for you. Is some of us shifting left or shifting right? <laughs> You must give your answer only in uh, assembly code, please, uh, bit shifts. Thank you. Awesome. Well, well, we'll get going. By the way, this is intended for you to be able to ask questions as well. I've obviously prepared some in case you're so full of lunch you just want to be entertained. But like, feel free to stick your hand up. I'll, I'll call on you and, and challenge folks, ask questions. We'd like to keep this interesting. And I think the most interesting people here are actually you. No offense, panel, but uh, we want to hear you know, the broad range of concerns from the audience. So I'm going to kick off and just, um, you can choose your own order to answer panel, but you know, you've, also, you've all talked about different places, different focuses in the supply chain. And uh, we hear a lot of things that are important coming from your regions, um, a lot of things that we as, as users and as operators need to pay attention to. So from your part of the world, what do you think is the single most important 
thing you're telling people about or the single most important issue uh, you feel people should be paying attention to right now? Go for it. I'll go for it. Um, so I think you know people talk about um, the supply chain a lot, and there's you know the standard diagram I've seen at least 16 times already today. Um, and I think you know there are various projects, particularly in open source, addressing um, points of weakness in the supply chain. I um, you know so Salsa focused on build integrity and, and tamper proofing artifacts and so on, and the uh, you know being able to anchor your trust in in a build system. Um, I think more fundamentally, or, or one of the areas that, that folks struggle with and seems to be a, a very high priority to me is really um, becoming aware, if you're not already aware, um, accelerating becoming aware of what your um, software dependencies are. And so looking um, you know, upstream in terms of the software you're ingesting, you know, we've seen stats around you know, 85 to 97 percent of commercial software um, you know, has some open source as part of its dependency. And I think there's, there's a universal feeling that you know, taking open source dependencies in your software you know, introduces some risk. And I think that there's, you know, that's a well understood concept and people get that. Um, but it's a very, uh, it's very unspecific. It's rather a feeling or a vibe that people get. There's, there's no very difficult to quantify that risk. Um, it's very difficult to assess it. It's a latent risk, essentially. And so in order to you know, begin to reason about that risk um, and you know, assess it and manage it and systematically reduce it over time, step one is really understanding what your dependencies are. Um, and it's, it's been surprising to me you know, the extent to which you know, folks aren't always aware of what, are, what even are all my dependencies. And you do have a good sense of you know, the inventory of the software upstream of you, which you rely on. And it's a big gap, and I think you know, closing that gap is, is step one to, you know, as I say, beginning to quantify, to reason about, and systematically reduce risk over time. You've first got to make it visible, and step one in making it visible is really understanding what your dependencies are. And it's a very fundamental thing, um, and it's a step that you know, many organizations are, are just beginning on, um, but it seems absolutely vital to me. Awesome, thank you. Quick poll here. Do you think you have a good grasp on what your open source dependencies are? I think that validates very well your point. Um, are you, do you think you should do? Good for you. And what do the rest of you think? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So I'm going to jump in here because I was told controversial opinions, right? Ed? Yeah. OK, I'm going to hit you all. So this is a security conference. But my, and this is not representative of Sneak, by the way. I know this is recorded, so everyone forgive me in the future. But um, if I, Randall disappears, we know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a conspiracy for sure. Uh, but my opinion, so the question is like, what is most important that's going on that people should be aware of? Uh, I would actually say maybe in, as a security community, we like, you know, we over market ourselves sometimes in the sense that, uh, Myself as a developer, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't actually care about security all that much. Like, I, I like the idea of things being secure and building reliable software that's safe for people to use. I think that's obviously the goal. But I think the key part in making that happen is making sure that developers are embedded in the security lifecycle and finding issues really quick and fixing them on their own, ideally without a big security team triaging and managing all the risk. And I think a lot of the times, in the security space, we, we like run the risk of trying to convince developers to care about security or trying to convince people to you know, put a ton of time and effort into it and learn about all these new protocols. I mean, you saw the alphabet soup on the screen earlier. I think for developers, it's just way too much. And so as a security community, my thought is, let's just do our best to make it automatic for people. Let's build tools that are going to be super developer focused give them a really nice experience so that they don't even need to think about it 99% of the time, only when it's absolutely critical. So that is my controversial opinion for the, for the panel for right now. Awesome. I saw lots of nodding heads, so we got friends. Sounds like Chad GPT is in charge of security. I would love that. That'd be so <laughs> great. <laughs> uh, maybe latching a little bit on the uh, concept of uh, we don't, it's important to start to understand what our dependencies are and what is the software, open source or not, that we are relying on when we are running our applications. One thing that I'm seeing from my perspective, uh, since Dig offers a platform that essentially covers the full life cycle of uh, uh, 
security for applications in cloud native environments. But uh, one thing that we are noticing our users latching a lot to is uh, the idea of uh, being able to prioritize. So not only to fully understand what you have, but also, if possible, reduce the burden. And uh, for example, one way that uh, uh, we do that is by leveraging a runtime information. So you know, you have a thousand dependencies. How many of them are they actually loaded in memory? And uh, people are just resonating to them, and they think that the core reason is uh, uh, people are a little bit overwhelmed, you know? And uh, uh, so I think as an industry, there must be an effort not only on accuracy and precision, but also in this ties to the concept of let's make this easy for the developers, you know? To reduce the work, reduce the burden, and prioritize, uh, if possible, in a way that uh, is, from one point of view, effective, and from the other point of view, less stressful. Sure, yeah. Um, sadly, I don't think I'm going to be very controversial because I <laughs> agree with everyone. Uh, the way I've been looking at a problem, which kind of encompasses what uh, these others, other panelists have said, is uh, so it's a three-stage journey. It's no, fix, and force. And this may sound familiar to some of the Googlers in the room because it was something I helped work on while I was at Google. But the, if you're clueless on where to start on the journey of supply chain security, like the first stage is no. You got to know what you're running. You got to know where it came from. You got to know how risky that software is. And then once you have that information, once you sort of know what the heck's going on in your production environments, the next stage is obviously you got to fix it and ideally fix it and prioritize it in a way that you're getting the biggest bang for your buck. Uh, so lots of tooling and stuff that's out there now uh, for, for helping fixing things. And then the last stage is you got to enforce it like throughout your organization. So if you've decided to take a stance that you know, everyone must use 2FA or you must use a certain technology or do things a certain way, then you got to make sure that that's what's being complied to throughout the organization. So three stages, no fix and force, and that's my where you start on this journey. Well, thank you. I'm going to provide, if not controversy, at least a searching question, because we said, well, you, you need to be you, but who is the you? Like, I think quite clear on Randall's you as a developer, although you can still talk about it. But like, when you say you need to be aware of these dependencies, you need to fix and force, who is that person? It's everyone. No, I mean, this is, this is maybe the, where the controversy comes in, because um, yeah, I see, it, I see it every day, where there's a constant tension between the security team and the developer teams. And security team wants to do things a certain way, but the developer team says, no, get out of our way. We're not using that thing. We're not follow following your policy. And it's this constant conflict that's going on. Um, so I think, you know, as, as to Randall's point, like these things sort of need to be done easy and by default. So you really need to win over developers. You need to get out of their way, but you need to give them the tools that they need to do their jobs uh, and make it so they don't have to think about these things. So it's... It is the chain guard mission to make solver security, supply chain security secure by default. So that's something we take to heart and we realize like we're going to be done as a company, as a startup, if we don't do these things that are easy for developers and people to adopt. So I, I want to add one thing to what Kim was just saying, which is like, okay, so what is the real key, you know, to like getting a developer to actually like fix some stuff, which is really hard to do. Like I know a lot of you, everyone in this room obviously cares about security because you're here, but one of the most difficult things is getting developers to care enough to actually go in and fix stuff. Even if you have like a backlog and prioritizations and all that stuff, right? It takes time and that's usually not someone's first focus. So my personal opinion, there's like three escalating ways to like achieve this. Like the first thing is providing enough education for people so they can Google something and like learn about it and like solve the problem. That's like step one, right? And thankfully, there's like amazing blog posts and YouTube channels and stuff that cover a majority of that stuff. Then you have, I think, escalating from there, or like getting better, would be uh, like gamifying the experience. So how do you incentivize developers to make security fun? And I think there's a lot of ways to do that. Maybe it's giving them points or giving them prizes for fixing things. Um, this is a shameless self-plug, but we actually run an event called The Big Fix every year where that's basically what we do. We try to get developers to just fix as many open source vulnerabilities as possible and compete against one another for prizes. Um, so that's like the second thing you can do. And then the third thing you can do is what all of us in the vendor community are always working towards, which is having that like seamless experience of 
tooling that just like eradicates the issue to even think about in the first place, which is super powerful, you know? In general, I think that if there is something that uh, modern shift left security has uh, drastically changed is uh, the relationship between the security team and the, developer, the, the developers and uh, the giant increase in engagement that, uh, that the developers uh, have, you know, they are much more part of the process. Now the question is, do developers like this <laughs> or not? <laughs> That's a great question. I hope, I, Isaac, I'm hoping you can also talk about customers and what works well there as well. And we have an audience question. Great. So, um, we talk a lot about devs. We talk a lot about ops. And we sort of talk about security and like by extension, right? And a lot of our focus, it seems like as an industry, it seems to have really been sort of like, just take care of the problem because security doesn't have to deal with it, right? But security really likes One of the problems that security's had for a long time is a mishmash of all these different tools that made their lives impossible with millions and millions of findings, right? And they came up with two big solutions. One is the SOC or the SIEM, right, where all the tools interoperate so they have one view of everything. And the other was baseless, right? We can't fix everything. Let's focus on where we're at now and getting better while not making it worse. So how do you think that we work better with security teams? I'll just repeat the question because there's a recording. You're saying basically we've talked a lot about dev and ops, left security out of the equation, and they have two ways. How can we bring them more into this pattern that we're talking about? When they're not going to look at any of our tools. Right. When they, right. They, they want their own world, the things they're used to. How can we plug them with them? Isaac. So I think, I mean, I think part, partly it's about providing um, a common view of a common set of problems. Um, and. You know, one of the things I'm working on at the moment, you know, around the, the topic of S bombs, and so you know, there was an executive order, 18 months or so ago, and what do you know? Um, if you supply software to the federal government, then you know, starting real soon, in fact June, um, if you're on a certain list, um, you'll be required to produce S bombs to provide alongside your software to the federal government, and so there's thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of organizations around the country right now in the, in the U.S. Um, getting good at, you know, producing S-bombs and getting ready to ship them to the federal government. And on June 15th, the federal government is going to wake up to a quarter of a million S-bombs in their inbox <laughs> wondering, what are we going to do with these things? Um, and what they're going to do with them, I hope, um, is start using tools like Guac. Um, and I'm really excited about Guac as a product being an aggregator of this metadata. And so if you imagine, you know, we're going to be, um, you know, thanks to the US federal government, we're going to start swimming in a sea of security metadata about our dependencies. And um, we're going to be overwhelmed by data. And Guac as, as a product is about how do we turn that data into information. And I think there's a secondary question then is how do you turn that information into value? And that's, that second process is audience specific. There are certain things that developers are going to want to do with a sea of S-bombs. Like when I import a new dependency into my IDE, I'm going to want to see it pop up and inform me about the risk of that dependency transitively down its dependency graph and so on. If I'm a, a risk assessor or a compliance expert at an organization, I'm going to want to take that data and have tools to convert that, that information into value for me. If I'm a security professional, I'm going to want to look at the, the same view of the same data, but customized to me to give me value. But I think it starts with um, everybody looking at the same set of data. And I'm, I'm encouraged by things like the, the executive order to um, you know, start to force the issue to have the industry and open source and you know, enterprise produce more security metadata about their software. There are these missing pieces that what do you do with it then? But gathering it all in the same place and so various audiences can share a common view of it seems absolutely key to me. So can I just ask Isaac before you give up the mic? Yeah. You know, as you're touring around and listening to people and we're talking about security folks and the executive order and S-bombs, do you get the sense that security professionals ready to ac access S bombs uh, uh, in this new reality or it's just like another thing coming their way like I know we talk a lot about it but like when it's going to hit the security professional's desk I, what are they are they ready what are they going to do absolutely not 
Um, and I, th I mean, I, th I think it's, it's a good point. And there's, there's a lot of focus right now when people talk about S bombs and the executive order, and you hear it at this conference as well. There's a lot of focus on how do we generate S bombs, what are the tools we use to generate S bombs. That's only a part of the problem. What do you do when you do wake up to a quarter of a million S bombs? I think something that's interesting about the, the S bomb journey the industry is on at the moment is it's the very beginning. S bomb is the beginning of end to end instrumentation of a supply chain. Once you've built the bus to transport S-bombs from here to there, there's all kinds of things you're going to want to put on that bus as well. You're going to want to put Salsa Providence on that bus. You're going to put open SSF scorecard information on that bus. You want to put open source you know, project lifecycle events on that bus. But S-bombs is forcing the creation of a metadata transport layer throughout the supply chain. And it is absolutely the very, very beginning. And I, I think, Ed, to your point, there's a massive tools gap around at the moment around how do we process and reason about this supply chain metadata? We're about to drown in it. Um, I don't have a great answer apart from pointing to, to your point, there is an enormous um, tooling gap at the moment. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's an opportunity um, as, as well as a challenge. Thanks. Well, I'd like to keep, keep on this question of like the security professional and where they mesh in with the, the operator and the, and the dev and kind of what you see work already. So I don't know if anyone on the panel can talk from customers and what they see in the wild. Uh, OK, I'll, I'll add one other thing. Sorry. Uh, I love this topic because like, whenever people talk about a lot of tools and security professionals wanting that visibility and measuring everything differently, like what is success? Is it baselining or this or that or reachability or whatever the discussion is? Like my instinct always is like, we should just build another tool to centralize all the tools. And then like, you know, that's, that's always the solution. But then you, it's always just like another thing, you know? And there's, the way I like to think about it is there's like states, you know? There's like the perfect state, and then there's like the current state, which might be terrible at some places or really good at other places. Then there's like the in-between, which in my mind is like the sweet spot. Like it, you don't necessarily have to be perfect and have a single, you know, security operations center that aggregates everything and perfectly classifies and prioritizes everything all the time. I, you know, one day I'm sure that's gonna be the, the standard for everyone, but today, like, it's just not really feasible. There's just too much going on. So, and again, this is not the sneak official opinion, but my personal opinion is what you wanna do is just like build a culture of like action, you know? So whatever your security team is doing, if they're measuring via just how many net vulnerabilities do we have, uh, or whatever, whatever thing they're looking at, that's totally fine. You just wanna build a, a culture where the security team is assisting and empowering the developers and operations people and everyone else to just go in and fix stuff without a lot of process. And the less process you have, the easier it's gonna be for people to like get excited about it, to actually do something to make a difference. So just basically like, just Nike, like just do it. <laughs> and then other than that, like it'll sort of sort itself out in the long run. It's a social problem, you're saying. What was that? Sorry. A social problem as much as a tool problem. It's, yeah, like an everything problem. <laughs> No, and that, that's why, in, in my opinion, uh, especially, you know, going back to the question, how, how do we make the different personas talk better and how we generate the right data that can be consumed by, by multiple teams? Um, I think it starts from standards rather than writing more software. And that's why, for example, this conference is, is really important, you know, and the work that the CNCF is doing in, in, you know, in, a, in a way that is biased toward building tools, you know, and uh, uh, having these tools becoming like a way for people to interoperate, stuff like OPA, stuff like, stuff like uh, you know, like common formats for S-bombs, stuff like the Falco language. Uh, these, these are the only way in the future that, that we have to sort of agree on a common language that then we can all use. And I think that visibility comes from there. I think that the communication and, and the correct sharing information then comes from that. And uh, uh, that's why I believe, and CISDIC believes, that uh, the future of security is open, exactly for this reason. I agree, too. And that was kind of my answer <laughs> to your question. Like, all these tools and stuff, they need to be rooted in open source standards and all the solutions, and I hope you know, most vendors are looking that way too. Like that's what's gonna kind of connect us all together and all this security stuff, it's an open source problem. <laughs> like we're not gonna get away from not using open source code. So I think the solutions need to be rooted there too. 
So in some ways, security is one of those fields where standardization is coming a little late to. You know, a lot of computing, we've had that wave already. So you're seeing that as a powerful force. Mm -hmm. Security yeah. and JavaScript are the two lagging communities, basically, <laughs> is what we're hearing. WebAssembly will solve everything, Randall. There's a question. Oh, let me take the mic. Can I borrow your yeah. microphone, too? We've got time for one question, I think. Um, this is a quick um, follow-up to Laurie's point uh, regarding um, enforcing uh, standards and um, um, uh, between security and uh, the developer. Like, is there an example? Like, how we, how would you enforce that through some kind of technical products or some kind of process uh, to ensure that standards is being applied like uniformly across the the enterprise, for example? Yeah, I mean, going back to the OPA example, for example, OPA is you know like a CNCF project, uh, and, and so it's, it's it's very relevant here. But I think that you know, as a concept, uh, OPA, the open open poly, policy language is pretty simple. You know, let's just define a domain-specific language to define policies. But it, 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 it had and it's having a profound impact on the community because for the first time. This is sort of a lingua franca that can be uh, used interchangeably uh, by different teams inside a single organization, but also across organizations to define anything that is a policy and that includes security, but it goes actually beyond security. So um, there are other examples, but uh, uh, I think that there's a huge difference between approaching things like that and throwing the data in the custom format of a SIM vendor, you know? Then, of course, the data is locked in there and you cannot really do a lot out of it, even if you have APIs and so on. So, something that is driven by the community, agreed uh, uh, upon by different groups of people, and then used as a standard to do multiple things, then just enables, you know, this kind, this kind of cooperation uh, and, and collaboration. I, I mean, I, I would echo that, and I think, you know, one of the interesting things I'd, I've seen from where I'm sitting at Google is there are, there are really three flavors of, of supply chain security at Google. There's the same set of problems across three, what, what I've been calling delivery domains. And delivery then, domain number one is, is open source. How do we make open source more secure by default? How do we look at you know, supply chain concerns in open source? Flavor number two at Google is Google's first party supply chain, our internal build system, source control policies, um, you know, binary provenance, um, uh, you know, inventory and so on. How do we think about Google's first party supply chain? And then the third flavor is products that Google is building to help its customers with their supply chains, and so products shipping through GCP. And looking at these three different domains, what's really interesting is that the problems are the, are the same. The supply chain security primitives and problems are essentially similar, but what's very different is the economics in each space and the set of incentives and the actors um, and the way that you know, value flows in these spaces. And that means that the, the way that we need to solve these problems is characteristically different across these three different domains. Things which are gonna work for Google in terms of its first party policy, things like executive mandates exist, barely at Google, <laughs> but they do. Um, you know, where you have top-down control and say, we're gonna do things this way. That's not an approach you can use in open source. Um, and so different techniques are needed uh, to solve these, these same set of problems in these different domains. But what's common is open standards, open frameworks, open tools, and you know, a common vocabulary which can be shared. And so I just echo Laurie's point that actually there's, there's a lot of power because this standardization can cross these domains which are characteristically different in rather interesting ways. Thank you. So it's great to end on this note of how important basically the topic of the conference is here today. I asked the panel to quickly finish off. I'm going to ask them to tell us what the most overhyped uh, technology acronym thing in the, their uh, field is and what they think is receiving too less of attention. So we'll deliver just again on the topic of the panel what to look at, what to be a little suspect of. Kim, are you ready to go? Oh man, this is going to be quite a hot take because I live and breathe this, but I honestly think software supply chain security, that word <laughs> is <laughs> so overhyped right now and it's really hard to, um, to weed through the noise and understand what's going on. Um, I think to round all this out together, I think, you know, the, the, the people that are claiming to do stuff in the space and everyone, like, a lot of it is, again, rooted back to open source, so I would make sure that 
you know, the, whoever whoever it is, is is investing in open source as they should because this is an open source problem above anything else, um, and kind of understand like what's what's actually happening under the covers there. But could be because I've been living and breathing the term for several years now that it's like everywhere. <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Larvis. Um, I. I operate quite a bit, especially in the open source community in the area of runtime security. And uh, my controversial take on something that is uh, overhyped is uh, eBPF. Uh, Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I think that, uh, it, I mean, I find it personally controversial because uh, I personally have invested a lot of time on this technology and my company has as well. But it feels like now everybody's just jumping on the acronym bandwagon without even fully <laughs> understanding what eBPF is, you know? Uh, how many people have heard eBPF? How many people think they understand exactly what eBPF does? <laughs> See? <laughs> exactly. you your if point. I was going to pick on you, who would still keep their hand up? Right. <laughs> so, uh, and, and, and that is detrimental to the whole community because then it feels like, you know, a vendor that uses eBPF, they just have a great solution, you know? While in practice, it's a platform, you know? It's sort of a mini computing platform in, in the kernel of the operating system, and you can use it to do m magnificent sense stuff and stuff that is completely useless. So that's my, that's my one. Thanks, Lars. Randall. So everyone's just saying their own company is overhyped this way, which I find really interesting. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I, like everyone's just calling themselves. You heard it I was going to say CVEs, but I didn't yeah. want us to get in a fight. <laughs> no, it's totally like, you know, whatever. Uh, so I was going to say, I actually crowdsourced mine. I asked a bunch of colleagues and friends like what they thought about this question, because I thought it was really interesting. And the one that I resonated with the most is a very particular type of supply chain attack, just typo squatted packages. Because typo squatting is something you see a lot in the, like tech press, like in security news, like you know, someone created a, a version of a popular library with one letter difference. And there's a lot of like PR that goes into that. However, in reality, those things rarely get used by developers, like single digit numbers across the board. And the, the things that are underhyped are that there's a ton of open source projects that have a lot of utilization and usage that have a ton of known CVEs in them and like known problems that are just like not remediated yet. And so I think that's a really big opportunity for like literally all of us in this room, maybe after we all just like whip out our laptops and just go fix, send one pull request to fix one of those. And that would make a bigger impact than like all the typo squatted stuff since the beginning of time, times like a thousand, you know? Awesome. Thank you. Um, so as, as someone who spends um, a lot of time at the moment thinking about S-bombs, I think S-bombs are overhyped. Um, and that's, <laughs> that's not because I don't love S-bombs. I do love S-bombs. I think they're awesome. But at the same time, I think they're overhyped. I think what's there's a, there's a misunderstanding. I think that, you know, I think, uh, you know, Kim and, and uh, a colleague of hers have coined this, you know, the SB and S-bomb doesn't stand for silver bullets, which I really love. Um, but there's... <laughs> You know, there is this perception that, gosh, S-bombs are going to get us there. They, this is finally going to do it for the, uh, for the security of everything. And they're truly not. Um, but I think that you know, if you are required to live the S-bomb lifestyle, you will be forced to adopt a whole number of different practices which themselves will increase and, and better your security posture. And if you look at the executive order, the policy goal of the executive order is not a sea of S-bombs. It's not even S-bombs. The policy goal of the executive order is better security. And they're pushing S-bombs because it's a vehicle to begin this journey with. And so I think looking at them in, in that way, I think there's, there's a ton of value there. They're super important. I'm really excited the industry is working on it. At the same time, if there's an expectation that, gosh, if we just do S-bombs, we'll all be OK, absolutely not. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, panel, for being here. You're a noble bunch, and thank you for your insights. And thank you very much for attending and your participation. Thank you. Thank you.